Thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Manny Grillo. Um, I'm a partner in the New York office of Baker Boss. This afternoon's presentation of our corporate series um, is perhaps uh, poorly but aptly titled, Staring Down the Barrel, Given the State of uh, the Energy Markets. Um, we, uh, we welcome you all today. We've, uh, we hopefully have put together uh, a, a presentation that you'll find interesting. Um, and I'm going to ask each of the uh, panelists to introduce themselves as we are uh, on the web uh, today, so that this way people know the voices as they come through. So I'll start uh, to my left. Uh, my name is Jim Prince. I am a financial restructuring partner in our Dallas office. I'm Shala Pritchard. I am a finance partner in our Houston office. Uh, I'm Richard Mordner. I'm a managing director and one of the heads of the restructuring uh, practice uh, at Jeffries out of New York. Um, just a couple of uh, introductory notes before we start. Um, for those who are uh, participating uh, by web or otherwise, if you have questions during or uh, after the program, please email them to Andrew Scott. Um, his email address is andrew.scott at bakerbots.com. We also note for the uh, lawyers in the room that this program has been approved for uh, the following CLE credit, Texas and California, one hour uh, participatory, New York, one hour professional practice, and that's uh, transitional and non-transitional. I'm a New York lawyer. I have no idea what that means. I just uh, I hope I can get the credits when we're done. And, um, and with that, why don't, we, uh, why don't we get started? Look at this. There it goes. Okay, great. So um, we start with a review of, uh, of 2015. And we characterized it as the tale of two half years, two halves of the same year, um, because I think we all saw very different things, uh, you know, happening from the first six months of the year to the second uh, six months of the year. Um, in the first half of uh, 2015, yep, tier exchanges with new money raises and consensual restructurings uh, dominated the market. Rich, you, you've seen a, you saw a bunch of those happen in the first half of last year, didn't you? Sure. I actually think the evolution was even a little bit more nuanced. It first started out with, we have so much secured debt capacity, let's go out and raise second lien. And then when the second lien financings happened and the market chasing yields, said, oh, this is great, I'm covered, I get a 10% yield. Later in the year, it became, well, I've got all this unsecured bond debt, let me roll up some. And in connection with that roll up of the, that, a portion of that claim, I'll raise new money. And I've been doing this 24 and a half years. I did more exchange offer work last year than I think in the pre prior 23 years. Uh, at Jefferies, I think we were involved in nine energy exchange offers last year. Um, and that really became, a, the goal was let's extend the option, the runway for, for equity, let's delever, but we're really not cutting interest all that much because the bondholder community was highly focused on well, if I roll up, I don't want that credit to just immediately trade back down. So there, there's usually an enhanced interest rate. There was a push to get new money into the situation. Uh, and then it was often done on a non pro rata basis. So you had bondholders jockeying for position prior to, you know, and a lot of these exchanges were done without going out and formally, you know, commencing the exchange and have it stand outstanding for 20 business days. And I, and I would say from, from our perspective, you know, the end of 2014 going into 2015, there was still a first mover advantage in going out, raising new money, second lien debt. That has closed up. I mean, you're not going to be able to raise second lien new money bonds in the way that you were at the beginning of 2015. And for example, Energy 21, they, I mean, there was such a hunger for yield that they not only placed 1.2 billion, but that upsized to 1.4 billion and then immediately started trading down. Um, so the next step in that evolution, again, was, okay, we can't raise new money, but what we can do is try to do the up tier, and that basically just means moving up the capital stack, and so exchanging a greater amount of unsecured for a lesser amount of secured. Again, those deals have been performing poorly, and so then the next evolution of that is, well, maybe what we'll start seeing is instead of a debt-for-debt debt exchange, some sort of exchange of unsecured for equity, cash, and maybe secured. Rich, what do you think about that? Do you think that's going to think that's going to stick? Do you think there's a market for that? You know, it's going to be tough to get those deals done. 
because when you look at where collateral values stretch today, mm -hmm. uh, there's really not that same pool of collateral that you could roll up an unsecured creditor into. Plus, you look at, you know, we thought we'd created so much value by eliminating, you know, we did one exchange offer, eliminated $500 million in debt, you know, over a six-day period. We thought that, God, this is so good for our client. And now we see those exchange notes are trading at 18 cents on the dollar. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> yeah, at the time, we thought we were smart. You know, we thought our client did absolutely the right thing. What we've done is more complicated that balance sheet, making subsequent restructurings harder to get done. The other issue, which is difficult about cash, Jim, mm -hmm. cash is at such a premium. And I know we're going to get into this a little later in the presentation about what companies are doing to you know, really build up their war chest. Giving cash to unsecured creditors who are out of the money, I think a lot of corporate boardrooms are going to struggle with that decision to, to, to facilitate a deal, even if it's, a, my, it's incredibly deleveraging. But is that the best use of the company's uh, capital? What about, what about um, equity? Put an equity kicker on there. Absolutely. Companies used to be very concerned about dilution for equity. If you can issue equity today to delever, you should do it all day long and twice on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing before we move ahead, I, I bet, Shaw, I wanted you to get your thoughts on. When, when these deals were done in the first half of 2015, Rich made the comment that they were uh, a lot more complicated. They came with tighter covenants, right? Yeah, I mean, that's right. And even now, you're going to see um, bankers, you know, put forth, you know, we're going to take your existing covenant package and just secure the notes, right? But, you know, be careful of that because inevitably you're going to have tighter restricted payments covenants where um, the new secured notes are going to, in order to, to be able to have a successful exchange, I mean, I think that's the next layer, which is you're doing an exchange and you're now the holder of the secured second lien note. You are not going to want the company to willy-nilly be able to take out unsecureds that are behind you in the capital stack. And so you're going to treat the unsecured debt as a restricted payment and use that basket capacity. That's going to have some implications going forward. Also, springing maturities that would um, spring the secured notes ahead of anything unsecured. Um, and you're already seeing that in some of these um, transactions having an impact. So, the last, sorry, the lasting impact of all those exchanges, I'm sorry, I thought he was looking at me. The lasting <laughs> impact of all these exchanges, we created more secured debt with more covenants, but is that debt really secured? Because I think one could argue that a lot of those secured positions or don't no, no longer have collateral and actually are unsecured and potentially treated the same way as the agreed on uh, down in the bondholder class. Right, because it's all about valuation. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll get into preference issues later, but really, I mean, in some of these transactions, given um, post-closing requirements and protection requirements, really what the holders did was, you know, potentially exchange a greater amount of unsecured for a lesser amount of unsecured. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, Rich, well, well said. <laughs> Rich, if, they, if there's perhaps not much of an appetite from investors to do the exchange anymore, um, and there's not an appetite on the companies to use their cash, which I appreciate that that's a high premium, right? Where does that leave us? You know, it, we're entering a new stage. We're in the boardroom. Um, you know, one of my partners is in the room. We, we, we present the boards. The, the climate is so different than it was six months ago. There's, a, there's an openness to really looking at the balance sheet and saying, I've tried everything. I've done the financings that Baker Partners just articulated. I've done the upturn exchanges that, you know, Jeffrey screwed up. And now, <laughs> where am I going to go? I've got a, I've got a capitalization that's just totally and completely non-sustainable. Uh, so for the company, yeah, it's amazing the number of board meetings I've been in where the people talk about American Airlines, where EMP upstream companies, and we're talking about American Airlines because the parallel is American didn't restructure and watched the rest of its industry restructure, eliminated billions and billions of dollars of debt around it, dealt with legacy liabilities, and then ultimately when it was time for American to restructure, they couldn't control their own destiny, and they, were, they did a merger with U.S. Airways to get out from bankruptcy. We are also seeing a management team, also who you know, a lot of, especially owners and operators who founded these companies, a lot of the emotion now of restructuring is gone. It's a view towards, well, if I have a management team promote, I'd rather have 10% of something that's worth something than 10% of uh, an option pool that's just behind $4 billion of debt that's never going to get repaid. 
So there has been a growing desire, actually, and part of the boardroom to engage in restructuring transactions. And kind of the new kind of uh, MO is no longer the Energy 21 second lien or the Halkine non pro rata exchange. It's the Magnum Hunter and the Swift, excuse me, restructuring transactions, which were both done on a prearranged basis. Right. So just in sum, the second half of the year was obviously then, based on the comments that I'm hearing from everyone else, a lot different than the first half of the year, right? And some of the deals, you know, there were no, as Charlie pointed out, there were no new financings in the exchanges done in the second half of the year, right? But the whole original plan, I think, as I thought, was, you know, you exchange debt for equity and also use that as a basis to raise new money, and that didn't happen in the second half. Right. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. And then some of the deals that were put together during the course of the year ultimately fell apart. And the result is that as the market continued to deteriorate, rate counts went down uh, substantially to 30% of what they were, and nearly 40 companies, I think, uh, filed for bankruptcy in 2015. Um, so that leads us to, you know, the outlook, and we sort of started to touch on this a little bit. Um, obviously, the number of troubled companies, you know, has continued to go up, and any analyst firm that you look at, um, has you know certainly indicated that the uh, that the market is dark at this point. Uh, Moody's places 130 oil um, EMP companies and oil field services companies um, on watch list and downgrades. Um, Fitch reduces its uh, changes its rating from to negative from stable. Uh, Debtwire, Deloitte, you know there's lots of numbers that that kind of add up to the fact that things aren't really good right now. When you talk about the numbers of debt or the amount of debt out there, Rich, and it seems like there's a substantial amount of debt out there to be restructured. And, you know, twice in my career, and I got I hope this statistic is accurate because I've quoted it at least 50 times. <laughs> um, twice as one sector of the economy contributed to more than 20 percent of the high yield index, and for in 1999-2000 it was telecom. Every CLEC went out and raised a gazillion dollars to build out alternative networks. And then at the start of 2015, E&P and oil field services was over 20% of the high yield index and the high yield market. And that's a much larger market than it was you know, 15 years previously. Um, another statistic that's been thrown about uh, that there could be over you know, 200 energy filing, energy and energy related uh, material filings this year. Right, which is, you know, is a staggering number, Jim, I think. That's, that's eye popping. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, as we've seen, it's not just upstream. I mean, that's going to have a trickle down effect, and it's already happening. And so Moody's this week downgraded a number of uh, investment grade offshore drillers. I mean, that's a, that's a segment that's getting hit. So when it's time for them to raise capital or their refinancing horizon is approaching, it's going to be a diff. I mean, they're now going to have to seek more high yield covenant packages and perhaps even secure previously unsecured revolvers. Um, you know, we'll touch on this with with the group, but again, um, historically, you thought that midstream was a little more insulated from commodity price risk due to hedges and other long term uh, contracted capacity, but now there is huge uncertainty around that, as well as the treatment of gathering systems and contracts and bankruptcy, and that's going to have an impact, too, um, on even the most uh, investment-grade midstream companies in the MLP sector. So it's really just a confluence of factors heading into 2016. Right. So is that last comment sort of a, a little bit of a hint at the Sabine decision yeah. and what we're talking <laughs> about there? So, yeah, so I guess we're all waiting for... Uh, a decision next week with respect to um, a bankruptcy case called Sabine Oil and Gas and how those contracts are going to be treated in bankruptcy, whether or not those, uh, those agreements uh, with the, <coughs> the um, transport and pipeline companies are, um, are uh, executory contracts or if they're covenants running with the land. And Jim, that is yeah, that's, um, uh, that. yeah, it does. That's, you know, this is an issue that I spent a lot of time on. Uh, um, Read a lot of the, read, I think all the briefing, but um, it's fundamentally an issue of if you have a gas gathering agreement, the gas gathering agreement um, will have a dedication of production to the gathering system, and you know that's critically important because the gas gatherer would have invested a lot of capital to build out the system. Um, what we're seeing is. In the Sabine case, the debtor has taken the position that it can use the bankruptcy power to reject the gas gathering agreement and leave behind the dedication, which 
that fundamentally was not the deal. Fundamentally is not the deal um, at the front end. So, you know, that, that is, a, that is a, a big issue, and the judge on Tuesday, 2.30 Eastern time, is going to, you know, give her ruling on whether or not the debtor's motion to reject is going to be successful for the debtor or whether it's not. And, you know, one outcome could be that, that she says, look, I'm going to allow the rejection of the contract, but I'm going to determine the effect of that and the effect of the dedication. I'm going to save that for another day. That's one outcome. That's what one of the gatherers was arguing should be the, the fairest outcome to allow the parties more due process to kind of argue the issues. Um, another outcome on the other side, the other side of the spectrum would be the court could, could fully take on the issue of whether the dedication that's contained in the contract, that's contained in the land records, that, that clearly is memorialized um, in the document as the intent of the party. Will she say that is or is not a covenant running with the land? And how bankruptcy law works, there's this power to reject contracts that are ultimately too burdensome for the debtor to perform going forward. But that power doesn't apply to real property interest. And so the issue is, does the covenant running with, is the dedication a covenant running with the land and thus is a real property interest that is outside this power, or is it something else that is subject to the power? That, um, you know, there, there will be certainly this panel listening in um, at the hearing uh, next, next Tuesday. That issue has surfaced again in the Quicksilver Resources where, on that Friday, I think. Mm -hmm, where the buyer, um, the winning bidder in an auction, conditioned its bid on the gas gathering agreement being rejected, such that the buyer is not going to be subject to those economics and would try to have a, um, presumably, a starting place for a renegotiated transaction. I saw it surface um, as recently as Friday of last week in a, a lesser known case in Fort Worth, Texas, called ENXP where um, the gatherer moved for permission to, to net some uh, gas marketing proceeds to cover the service fee under the gathering agreement. And ENXP responded and said, well, I don't think you're entitled to that. And oh, by the way, I think your gas gathering agreement is something I can reject in bankruptcy. And then went ahead and briefed the issue um, on whether or not the gas gathering agreement is or is not a real property interest. The dollar amounts in that case are considerably smaller. That issue should never see the light of day in a court because the dollars are smaller. It should settle in all likelihood, and I think the debtor was just trying to get leverage on the gatherer. But you're going to see that issue um, come up in bankruptcy cases because you know, there's just not enough value. And so people are looking at leverage points and seeing where they can push to ultimately increase their returns. So. so interesting issue. you've got a couple of courts looking at this issue, you could have um, one opinion that comes out first, that'll be the lead opinion, um, or you could have different opinions coming out. And, you know, obviously every agreement's written a little bit differently, um, but there's an irony, I think, in having a New York bankruptcy judge uh, making a decision with respect to how business has been done, you know, um, in Texas and elsewhere for, you know, generations. I think there's some sort of... Uh, <laughs> it's um, it's not the ideal venue, <laughs> but um, well, we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll see, and... You know, the briefing on, on both sides is exhaustive, and um, we'll kind of see what happens. Okay. I'm just hoping that the, the outcome is not too damaging, um, but we'll see. Okay. Um, so we, we sort of uh, we, we keep touching on this uh, um, throughout the program when we start talking about, uh, about trends for 2016. And, um, uh, Rich, one of the things is that, we're starting to think that bond deleveraging, which was our answer in 2015, and you know, uh, Jim and I worked on one of the early pre-packs where we actually got that done relatively quickly, got Hercules offshore in and out. That may not be enough anymore. You know, when we look at where values break, uh, even a full equitization of the bondholder class is often not going to be enough. And I want to interrupt for a second because a lot of clients right now are asking me because sort of the buzzword right now is what is the fulcrum security? And if you want to talk about that a little bit sure. and be, how that's going to segue in. Be happy. In, in a restructuring context, the fulcrum security is the, is the security or debt instrument where the value lies, where value breaks. There's going to be some element of debt that's covered. 
there's going to be that next element where value doesn't break through. And in theory, that's the, that's the security that will convert into the majority of the equity upon a, a restructuring transaction. But every restructuring comes down to basically three things. Like what's the value of the company? How much debt capacity does the business can, can sustain? And what are the motivations of the personalities of the people involved in the actual transaction? The fulcrum security, more and more, we are finding it to fall actually within the revolving, uh, you know, <coughs> the, the revolving uh, credit facility. Which is a nightmare for lenders. So. <laughs> I'm like, I'm eight levels. They, yeah. And the restructuring tools, you can't compel a revolving cre uh, creditor, credit facility holder, to take back equity. You know, and also the regulators don't want the RBLs taking back equity. So we're in this very difficult situation where we need to raise money. There's not money out there in the high yield market for good issuers today. How are we supposed to find capital for an industry that's under duress and, um, you know, in order to pay down the banks so you can have a performing revolving uh, credit facility, then you have this next chunk of capital. If that capital comes into the stack, they don't want the bonds to equitize and take 100% of the company. They want to take 90% of the company, 95% of the company. So we're creating the fulcrum at a higher point within the capitalization. That becomes the equity, and the old bondholder class, which can be billions and billions of dollars, is fighting for a seat at the table. I have never seen, you know, really going back to the period of short time in the financial crisis, bondholders so unwilling to invest today to protect their investments, most likely because they've written them down sometimes from par to literally under a penny. Do they want to go to an investment committee and say, hey, great idea, I can double or triple down into this credit, no, you know, they, they mark the market, they've ridden it off, and it's really difficult to find capital today. Other than, and we'll get into this in a little bit, there's a whole pool of private capital that's been dedicated, hasn't really been deployed for very sophisticated parties, and what we, I think, will see is those sources of capital coming in, not to buy up bonds, not definitely not to buy equity, and maybe not even to buy assets, but rather to come into this new fulcrum security, which will be the kind of last out piece in the revolving credit facility. Yeah. Is that, are you referring, Rich, to kind of like the, the exit finance piece? Yeah, I think actually a lot of times might what happen is this money would come in as a convertible debt. You come in, mm -hmm. you pay down the revolver, the revolver then could convert to a conforming revolver on the back end, and whatever money came in would com convert into the majority of the equity. And I think really how that is, how this is translating into the day of day in the life of um, our E and P, you know, borrowers are that when lenders are sitting and, and revolving lenders that have their borrowing base, have their reserves as collateral, are finding themselves in these restructurings as the fulcrum security, which is again a nightmare position for a commercial bank to be in. Um, it is really translating into increased um, being increasingly conservative. Um, in their portfolio. So right now, the major banks that are in the RBL space, the J.P. Morgan's, Wells Fargo, Scotia Bank in Canada, um, a disproportionate amount of their reserves for bad loans are in the RBL space. And so as a function of the percentage of their overall portfolio, the bad loan reserves are, are against the RBL. What that's translating to is really um, being more conservative in borrowing base redeterminations. I mean, I think that in 2015, again, one of the, the early trends was they were not going to sort of shock the system and do aggressive borrowing base redeterminations. So I think that now um, we can expect that the borrowing base Redeterminations coming up in the spring are not going to, you know. It could be blood on the track. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other, the other area of concern is really, you know, before it just was sort of about, well, what's a consent fee? If I want to do a transaction, need a technical consent under my revolver, you know, let's just talk about how many bits that's going to cost. And I think that now, what I'm counseling borrowers is just try to structure your transaction so you don't have to go back to your bank group and ask for a consent because what's the pound of flesh and is that going to translate into either tighter covenant or, you know, God forbid, anti-hoarding um, provisions, which, you know, again, in 2015, doing a lot of these up tier exchanges involved, you know, uniformly having to go back to the syndicate and get consent. What you didn't see as part of that consent was any sort of anti-hoarding mechanism or, um, 
requirements put in. Just take one second and just explain what you mean by anti-hoarding. Yeah, basically, I mean, really anything in there that says you can't draw down everything on the facility and have it sit there on your books, and so you've got to clean it. But you mean like what's been happening yeah. in the marketplace in the last three months, right? Right. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, you just need to be cognizant of less appetite for, for revolver lenders to, to concede in ways that can hurt them. You know, the other thing is, too, as you start looking into the, um, the filings and the collateral packages, although there is a 80 percent, um, you know, mortgage requirement, traditionally because the NT companies have been so acquisitive and, you know, they're, they're sort of always behind that. And so if you always test it at any given point, they're not at 80 percent. Um, also, you know, things that will help in a bankruptcy, but not necessarily, um, uh, you know, going forward is in a lot of these credits, cash didn't have to be collateral. And so deposit accounts, securities accounts, things like that were um, unencumbered assets that weren't covered by the lien. And that's coming to an end if, they, uh, if letters can yeah, make that I mean, happen. Yeah, it's, it's these things where I'm saying if you're going to go back for technical consent for something, you know, it might not just be, okay, we're going to give a consent for you know, 200 basis points to do this. It might also be, well, let's try to tighten this up, this up, and this up. Right. Um, the other thing also is just amend and extend. And so as the five-year maturities are drawing near, I think lenders are going to increasingly look at what unsecured bonds would fall into an extended maturity and want to address that issue. Because I think the appetite for allowing an extension of the maturity date that would allow unsecured bonds to fall within that is going to be less, an right. less than zero. Yeah. Yeah. Less than zero, right. Because the bottom line is that you're going to then be stuck refinancing two pieces of debt instead of one, Rich, right? Right, and you're giving the bonds a seat at the table potentially where they otherwise wouldn't have one. That wouldn't well, have it's just one. a paradigm shift. You know, in 2014, even going into 2015, there was still um, the belief that well, you can refinance your bonds, right? Mm -hmm. right with, with you know, might be more expensive bond debt. You can you can get there. And now there's really uncertainty around if that avenue of refinancing will be available. Right. So the lack of capital ultimately means that the, the restructurings and the bankruptcies are right. going to rise. Uh, too, just right? one y yes, one comment for for this is really for Shala. So if you have a company that draws down, let's say, all of its revolver, mm -hmm. and there isn't an anti-hoarding covenant. Or there's not a a restriction on where the money has to be held, and so let's say the borrower um, moves it outside the syndicate. What what can the bank or the syndicate do to kind of address that situation where oh a bunch of money has just went outside my lien? Yeah, other than cry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, I think that. Uh in an RBL deal, I mean, so before a borrower borrows everything under its line, they, they sort of have to have a game plan, right? Because under most RBLs, you know, the lenders will have the ability to do an interim borrowing base redetermination. So if they trigger that right and then redetermine the borrowing base and then there's an over advance um, found to exist, then depending on how tight that uh, revolver is, either the borrower has to immediately repay that, and that's more rare, or they get up to six months to repay that over advance and six monthly, uh, equal monthly installments, and so it just starts the clock, right? I mean, you're going to eventually, if that happens and you're in an over advance, you're going to have to pay it back, but the question is, in that interim time, are you going to be filing? Filing bankruptcy. Right, so, so you need a strategy, right? right. So, you know, it's, it's pull down the cash if you can, but the bottom line is, is that is that you need a strategy? Mm -hmm. one, one last issue uh, on the trends for this year that we wanted to just touch on quickly. Um, you've probably read about this in the press a little bit. Um, you know, there's a huge focus on tax issues as a result of certain structures, particularly the MLPs and the LLC partnership issues, because of the COD income, right? So, uh, just quickly, obviously, to the extent that. Um, any of this debt is written down in a debt for equity conversion, um, you know, because as Rich points out, the fulcrum security is, you know, up here as opposed to down here. Um, that generates COD income, and usually there's an insolvency exception that people don't worry about. The problem in both the MLP and the LLC partnership structures is that um, that goes to where the taxpayer ultimately is. And so all of the parties that have you know, unit interests in the MLPs or the LLCs, they're the ultimate tax payer. And so you're seeing in situations where you've got, 
these uh, debt for equity conversions or even some of the exchanges that have been done um, you know, uh, to this point in time, it's been a big issue because holders now are stuck with, um, are stuck with uh, COD income. So not only have they lost their investment, they've got a rather material tax bill on top of it. And they're not getting distributions this year to offset, to at least have the cash to pay a portion of that tax bill as well because a lot of these MLPs have cut their distributions or dividends. Right, exactly. So that's, you know, that's something, I mean, and we could do, you know, hours upon that and, you know, it's complicated tax issues, but we just wanted to highlight that because as you see some of these structures, you know, that were popular um, now coming into focus in a restructuring area, it's going to create um, a new set of issues, I think, um, you know, for investors that nobody really contemplated when things were there as far as that goes. I think Jim asked a good question, too, when we talked about where capital comes in. The other well, the reason why I said that is everyone wants to lock everything up and have, have the situation with a bow around it. But one of the reasons that's also, uh, I think, very important, this is the last trend I'd like to mention is here, so much of the companies that we're all dealing with EBITDA is a result of their hedges. That hedge book is burning off. If you do file, what are the set-off rights on those hedges? Do you just have to pay down the RBL immediately? So. We've got all these moving pieces, all of which are taking capital kind of out of the company uh, or giving future cash flows out of the company. So the idea here that we'll just go into bankruptcy and we'll figure it out, you know, I really think if companies want to survive, they want to line up that financing almost, you know, before they go in, have that financing, have a conversion feature either into a permanent exit facility or into the equity of the company. Uh, so that you're not in an extended bankruptcy, which one is very expensive, and two, the long dated bankruptcies tend to all just migrate to 363 sales, and it's hard pressed to think of a worse environment to try to be marketing, you know, uh, the assets in today. Asset. Right. You know, so but you know, it's hard for the companies, but it creates opportunities for investors, arguably. I think there'll be generational opportunities for investors uh, to to put money to work over the next two years. It's been those who jumped in early absolutely got burnt. But now when we're looking at, you know, where, where values are breaking, the type of security you can invest in, um, you know, ultimately I think people will do well. And I think there is a ton of very sophisticated private capital you know, waiting to be deployed, figuring out how best to access it and how best to get that capital to allow, you know, the, the industry uh, to enter into a new stage. So as we kind of move forward, and we've talked about this a little bit, Shala, you know, these, this next round of borrowing-based redeterminations and their impact, you know, we talked about them happening in March and April and ballpark in terms of timing, um, and they've already had an, an effect on the market. Well, so they're not the drawings on, on the line are, I think, going to be on the lender's mind um, in setting the borrowing bases for March and April. And so again, I think that a conservative approach is what, what should be expected in the market. I think, um, you know, for the uh, for the most part, lenders honor draw requests. I don't know that borrowers should count on that happening going forward. I mean, I think that the MAE rep, which historically has been um, difficult to, to say that there has been a reasonably be expected to be an MAE, that's been hard in an M&A context, but I think in a banking context, if you really look at that rep um, in, in the light of a specific borrower, I think um, that'll be one area of concern. But also, you know, the solvency rep, um, the CFO has to sign the solvency, you know, make that rep and sign, sign the certificate. And so I think increasingly you also see some CFOs um, really taking a hard look at that rep and, and not just um, making that rep lightly. Not every solvency rep is the same. Right. I mean, um, over the last few weeks, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at solvency reps, and I can tell you that, and I don't know why it is, but, um, you know, there are some deals where language is slipped in that doesn't really track, kind of track the law. And so if you're thinking if a court was actually trying to interpret what those yeah. what the words mean on the piece of paper. Um, it can give some flexibility to to um, issuers just because you look at the language and it's like it's different. It's not it's not consistent with, you know, eight other deals. It's kind of unique, which might provide some borrowers with um, some runway to get over it. We'll see. 
And, and Shelley, earlier you talked about what once you draw down that, um, you know, you start a timeline. And one of the things that comes up in that context is, okay, now you've drawn down the debt. You may have some issues with your covenants, right, particularly your financial right. covenants. And then ultimately that could cause you audit opinion issues, could it not? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that's more behind the scenes that, that, that most people aren't picking up on. It's, it's not in the document. It's, it's really... Um, for some issuers, you know, sort of, if you think about, they get a clean audit, right, and then three to six months later, file bankruptcy. So the PCAOB is putting <laughs> tremendous pressure on accounting firms for situations like that, right? You, you issued a clean audit, there's no going concern qualification, there's no language around this at all, and then the issuer files. And so it's really the oversight body of the accounting firms that are putting pressure on the accounting firms and even, um, you know, that's sort of a strategy and planning thing to look at in terms of the timing of a filing um, with respect to when is the audit coming out and how are you going to manage language. If you look at, I mean, short of a uh, going concern qualification or language, you may start seeing even in the audit for companies that have publicly announced that they've hired advisors, um, some, some language. Yeah, huge trigger in yeah. and of itself. In and of itself, right? So, so if Bridge has been retained in a deal, obviously they're not getting a clean opinion at some point. Well, so. <laughs> it might not. It might not rise to the, the language and the audit may not rise to the level of setting off a qualification. Qual, you know, the the, the um, revolver covenant for for going concern qualification, but but there will be something in there. Okay. So what this is all leading to, um, we think, is uh, an increase in the number of bankruptcies and. One of the quotes um, that I read somewhere a long time ago that always seems to make sense to me is, capitalism without bankruptcy is like Christianity without hell. You can't have one without the other. Uh, and that actually came from uh, the former chairman of, of the late great Eastern Airlines, so I think he knew what he was speaking at the time. Um, but when we talk about this, and we're just gonna kind of run through this a little bit quickly, at least in the beginning, uh, because Rich made this point earlier, that valuation drives the bankruptcy process, Rich, right, in terms of determining that, all that discussion about the fulcrum security, this is where it particularly becomes important in this context, does it not? No, a absolutely. When you, when you think about, you know, how, what's the company going to look like on the other side, you know, you start with a finite amount of value, and in E&P in particular, unlike a lot of other industries, there's a lot less for debate, you know, because so much of this is done off the value of the reserves, there's a very established uh, valuation paradigm out there. You know, we could be looking at, you know, John and I could be on opposite sides of a, a deal valuing a, an industry company. It could be, well, the projections look like this and the DCF looks like that. Although there's a finite value often in place here for, for these assets, for these reserves. And, you know, what, off of that, you drive the discussion, I found, to much faster to what value is, where you then get into interesting things as well what's really unencumbered, have all the liens been perfected, what do the unsecureds really have access to. Uh, so the debate upon value is less pronounced, I think, in, in, in E&P uh, parlance than it is in other, other industries. And that's the first starting point, what's the company's worth, and then how much debt can we put against it, and then how can you build consensus among various stakeholders who are really in a zero-sum game. Other types of transactions we do. You know, you're doing a financing deal, well, bah, damn, maybe it would price 50 bips wider. Well, this comes down to I'm getting a recovery or I'm not getting a recovery. You know, where does value break? And it, it, an M&A deal can work for both sides. You know, generally, you know, if they're fighting over value and bankruptcy, you have a winner and you have a loser. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, Jim, when we talk about implementation when we're doing these deals, um, you know, we have typically three ways we can go in terms of the, the Chapter 11 cases, right? We can do a pre-pack, a pre-negotiated deal, or a pre-fall, um, just quickly. sort of. Yeah, just uh, the significance of, of the three alternatives is, is the level of um, pre-bankruptcy agreement and implementation. You know, pre-pack, you know, that's, that's the one where the work is done, almost all the work is done outside the bankruptcy process. You get a restructuring support agreement with bondholders usually. You draft your disclosure statement and plan, you do a solicitation, you count your votes, you know the outcome, and when you know the outcome, you then file bankruptcy and then you try to get out as soon as you can. That's usually, what was Hercules, 40 days? 45 days, 45 yeah. days. 
pre-arranged, um, there's more, there's still quite a bit of, of work pre-bankruptcy, but it has a longer tail during the bankruptcy period, and that's because you don't do the solicitation. You still have a deal, you still have it documented in a restructuring support agreement, you still walk in with a Chapter 11 plan and disclosure statement ready to go, but you file that with the court, you set a hearing for approving the disclosure statement, you get that approved, you then do your voting, you then go to confirmation, and then you get out. So that's probably another 60 to 90 days on top of, of the pre-pack scenario. Right. Just an issue of, of, of really um, cost. Um, if you have the liquidity runway, people try to do the pre-pack. If you don't have the liquidity runway and you need you know, new money and it's only willing to come in on a post-bankruptcy basis, then you're usually in the pre-arranged situation. If you do not have a deal with the critical mass of your, of your key creditors, then you're in the free fall situation or you're, you've just simply run out of money, in which case you're filing bankruptcy in hopes of finding the solution. Not the ideal situation, but it happens. Well, I just want to add, I mean, again, there's so much to cover here, and so this is really just, um, I want to touch on this point, which is in a free fall case, I mean, that's, you know, literally the company has run out of or is running out of money or is already in default or facing a default. Long before that happens, I think a company will know um, that they're headed there. Um, what's less clear is when should we look at a prepack? When, sh you know, we have, we have a lot of liquidity. We have a lot of um, runway. We can still pay our bond payments. And we can pay, you know, interest. But, but one thing is that before you get to the, the free fall scenario, um, for, for, for um, in-house attorneys that are listening or the GC clients, I mean, what, what, what we've been doing is really encouraging um, a, a board refresher for fiduciary duty. Right, and starting early is And your starting point, right? early, that's right. I mean, it's sort of, if you're doing that when you're looking at a free fall, that's, that's too late in the process, right? And so, Really, if, if you've got a falling stock price, um, if bonds are trading at distress levels, um, again, you can have a ton of liquidity on the balance sheet, and that's not the problem. But it, you look at what your bonds are doing and trading at and de or declining EBITDA, and around that time, really, you should have a refresher on what are the duties of the board and, and, and what, are, what, what does the board need to be aware of. Right, and, and, and you know, does the, time is money, time is value, you know, uh, the more you have, the more options you're going to have. And what you find more often than not is that, you know, if you wait too long, Rich, the options just kind of go away. But absolutely. The best time to be preparing for this is when you do have options. And one of the key elements, I think, of the difference in the cases which just articulated is, in theory, everyone likes to do a prepackage. No company likes to go into bankruptcy. No company likes to stay in bankruptcy for an extended period of time. Prepackage gets you in and out. But sometimes you do need bankruptcy. And you may need bankruptcy to do things that you can't do in a prepack, like reject certain contracts, use the tools of the bankruptcy trade to eliminate certain liabilities in a way that aren't possible in a prepack. Um, so, you know, when you think about what should the company be doing, it's really working at the board level of management to see what the real alternatives are. Is there an M&A solution? Is there a solution that involves an out-of-court uh, situation? Because that, that remains preferable. But at the end of the day, going into bankruptcy with a plan and being able to communicate to your key stakeholders that bankruptcy is just a means to an end, not going in to figure things out, often allows the companies to get in and out quickly and to, and to and many times thrive on the other end. Okay. So that takes us to one of the topics that we were talking about, and we'll try and go through this quickly and reserve um, before we get short on time. You know, Jim, distressed asset dispositions and acquisitions, we've talked about the M&A activity that we expect to see, um, you know, the, the question, I guess, becomes sort of, you know, there's different ways to do this, is there not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, you know, what we're seeing is, whereas last year, perhaps companies were putting up to market, you know, second tier, third tier quality assets. Now, in this kind of lower for longer pricing environment, we're seeing companies that um, are actually considering parting with some of their, some of their better assets. Um, in order to get liquidity and, and help solve some of their balance sheet issues. Um, what, th then there's the other side of the spectrum, right, where, where 
the borrower is basically in some type of a forbearance agreement is is needing needing um, needing a solution. RBL lender kind of wants the collateral disposed of, and there are kind of two ways to do that. Well, actually, three ways. One, if um, if you if if you can reach a deal, if the lender can reach a deal with the borrower, where the borrower will agree to just convey the collateral as part of a global settlement, that can be done quickly. And for middle market companies, companies that uh, where you have kind of founder founder operated, that can be an efficient way to move collateral from from one entity to the other without a lot of cost. It's a voluntary, it's a settlement. It's a settlement. And you know that has worked in the past and it'll continue to work, but it doesn't work for every capital structure. And you have to have um, one a level of trust with the borrower that you're getting good information from the lender's perspective, and that's not always the case. And, it's, and it is typically the case that to make that deal work, the um, there's got to be some form of concession that's that's given to the owner to play ball. It may be a waiver of of a guarantee. It may be a, a monetary payment that is in exchange for a covenant not to compete or transition services. It's basically a way a way to get the the borrower to um, go along with the deal. Yeah. The the other the other scenario would be uh, you know, kind of the lender saying, "I'm going to have to allow you to use some of my capital to pay for the deal, but here are the milestones in which you're going to start the company, and it may be done outside of bankruptcy." It Either way, what I'm seeing is, is asset sales that are, that are going up, and there's really not a lot of time. So bidders who can mobilize, launch on their diligence, get in there and present a bid are being rewarded for their efforts. That's what I'm seeing. And I mean, we'll similar. Sort of jump around a little on this, but I mean. You know, the, the two dreaded words for a purchaser of assets outside of bankruptcy is, is fraudulent conveyance. And so that's the other thing. I mean, some people that are sitting on the sideline right now waiting to purchase um, strategic assets, um, within a 363 sale, you mitigate that risk. I mean, right now in some of the out-of-court purchase and sale agreements, there is fraudulent conveyance risk, which we can discuss mm -hmm. later ways to structure around that, but there's also risk in terms of if your counterparty, if, 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 if the seller is um, in perceived or actual financial distress, you know, what is what is your um, recourse for breach of threats, indemnities? How are you going to structure that so you can actually collect on that um, indemnity basket? And, mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm seeing, uh, I'm, you know, on one hand, if you do it outside of a bankruptcy process, you know, you don't don't have the risk of being topped in the bankruptcy auction. Like, hey, not being topped is a good thing. But you're weighing that against, well, what's the likelihood that the seller is going to file bankruptcy? And what is the likelihood of um, I might be sued under a fraudulent transfer theory? And the fraudulent transfer, we might as well just go ahead and address it now. Yeah, but exactly. it, it, you know, it's been around for forever. And it's just basically the concept of when when a seller is in financial distress, as defined by either being balance sheet insolvent, which is not book value, it's fair value of the assets, or it's not able to pay its debts as they come due, or it's undercapitalized. If it's in that financial condition, and during that financial condition, it parts with an asset and doesn't receive reasonably equivalent value in exchange, the law to protect creditors will step in and unwind the deal. What is reasonably equivalent value? You know, courts focus on it's a totality of the circumstances test. Well, what does that mean? Classic legal answer. Yeah, right? yeah, well, who makes up these things? We know what we did. <laughs> right. We know we know it's not a dollar for dollar exchange, but there's not a bright line test. So what that means is, um, you know, if a buyer is getting a good deal, but it's not too good a deal. The law will probably not step in and unwind that. There are other factors. If the buyer, or I'm sorry, if the seller went through a marketing process, it's really hard for a court, looking back, to think that that the price that the auction produced or that the bid process produced was somehow unfair. One one interesting point there. 
uh, and I've seen this at both representing buyers and sellers, if you want to mute the potential for a fraudulent conveyance action, something a lot of uh, transaction parties don't think of is actually getting an opinion that doesn't, you can get a fairness opinion, but you'd also want to get an opinion that actually runs to reasonable equivalent value because it's a different standard than just getting a fairness opinion. Something could be fair because that was the only alternative the company had, but did that still constitute reasonable equivalent value? And, you know, it's, it's definitely it's not a, a fail-safe by any stretch of the imagination, but something the board should consider doing. Well, and we, you know, as best practices um, for our private equity clients doing um, asset-based JV deals and drill codes, I mean, depending on the situation, absolutely doing a CPA that there is a solvency opinion from a Houlihan or, or, or similar um, uh, investment bank. But, but that was really at first pushed back on, like this is not market, this is never in the context of a JV deal, anything that we do. And the answer is, well, nothing is market right now and there is no new normal. So best practices and, and it protects, um, it really protects you in it's not just positive of value, uh -huh. but it gives you a good faith defense. So you can get something in the bankruptcy equivalent to what, what you put in. Right. I am also seeing in deals, you know, greater focus on the part of the buyer to kind of negotiate more robust solvency representations, more robust fair value representations, um, uh, focusing on, you know, representations that the transaction is not going to, to be in violation of debt documents, which, you know, you didn't really have to worry about much of that stuff two years ago, three years ago, what have you. Yeah. But it's certainly um, big points of negotiation at the moment. I want to hit, because we're almost running out of time and we want to leave a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, just quickly on 363 sales and bankruptcy, you know, that's the, uh, that's the, the code section that it refers to. Um, so you'll hear that term thrown around a lot. Um, and what it basically is, is a bankruptcy auction, in fact. Um, you know, if somebody wants to come forward and put uh, a stocking horse bid on the table um, and take a first mover advantage, they'll generally get the benefit of a little bit more diligence as part of that process, but uh, the protection of certain bid procedures that'll be approved by the bankruptcy court, um, including a breakup fee and expense reimbursement, um, and the court set those um, as part of the process. Um, also, who else can bid? Um, there's a question as to whether or not entities are qualified bidders. You know, not just anyone can come to the table in this context, uh, Jim, right? I mean, you, you got to basically show that you have the wherewithal and yeah, you're going to yep. come in and compete. Um, and last thing, you know. Buying a claim like a small, yeah. yeah, this yeah. is, you know, I, I see bidders doing this now, and it, it's, always, it, it's always good to do. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to buy a trade claim. You have to find them, but you, you can usually do that, particularly if you're in the industry. And it doesn't really cost much to buy a few thousand dollar claim. But having that claim, if you're going to participate in the 363 process, can be very valuable in that you then are a creditor and you have standing in the case. So if there becomes some you know, procedural mischief that's going on, and sometimes it happens, um, you, have, you have a claim and you have the ability to go into court and say, I'm calling. I'm calling this out. There's something that's not quite right. The other thing that that benefit, that the having a claim can benefit you, is let's say you're a stocking horse. Until the judge approves your break fee, you're essentially swimming naked. Until the judge says, "I'm going to give you that break fee." Well, as a stocking horse, you try to compress the timeline between when you cut your deal and when the court approves the break fee. But there could be circumstances. Maybe the court's in trial. Who knows? Where, where the gap between when you cut your deal and when the court approves the break fee is longer than what you like. If the deal goes sideways and the debtor basically goes to another bidder contrary to your expectations, there is a mechanism for the judge to still give you something. It's called, if you make a substantial contribution, if the debtor uses your bid to bring in a higher bid before the judge has blessed you with the break fee or has, has granted your break fee, the court still has the way to give you a substantial contribution claim if he feels that you've made a contribution. But if you're not a creditor, you may fall outside the, the scope of the statute. So 
it's like buying insurance, right? You can yeah. find a claim. Spend the, spend you know, the couple thousand dollars, a couple hundred dollars to, um, to buy the yeah. proof of claim from somebody else. Right. But, um, but there is a real benefit to kind of doing it that way. And as we look at this environment and we look at the M&A opportunities that are out there, um, I think you'll see this become more and more frequently used because um, the companies are going to have to file and they're going to have to dispose of assets as part of this process. Um, we're going to open it up to questions in a second, but I was told that I need to make this part of the presentation uh, for those, again, looking for CLE credits. And that is all attorneys participating via webinar must note, that this, must note this number on their affirmation form in order to earn the appropriate number of CLE credits. And that number is 58539. Um, I feel like I'm doing one of those drug commercials on TV where you have to give all the disclaimers of all the things that you have to, uh, all the things that can happen if you don't, uh, or if you take the medicine and it has an adverse effect. So with that, um, I'd like to see if there are any questions, um, you know, in the audience for purposes of anything that we've talked about today. We answered all their questions. Uh, it seems that <laughs> way um, as far as that goes. Well, um, I don't know any, uh, if we don't have a question, uh, why don't we take a 20 second, 30 second party comment from everybody on the board, as to, on the panel rather, as to what's, what they're thinking about and what they sort of see happening ahead. That we, final thoughts. Final thoughts, increased activity in the courthouse. Companies are no longer have trepidation about using bankruptcy <coughs> in the UP sector to accomplish their goals. There will be opportunities for new money investments, often through investing at the top of the capitalization. Uh, and generally speaking, unlike some of the, the investors chasing yield over the last two years, you would think that where you are based upon your entry point and, and the cyclical nature of the industry, uh, that those could be some very attractive investments uh, over time. Oh. And I think that 2016, the emphasis is shore up your capital sources and find the sources you can to make sure that you can refinance within the window supported. Jim? Um, I agree with Rich. We're going to see a large number of bankruptcies. I think they're going to be particularly short bankruptcies. There's just not the liquidity for, you know, these long, expensive bankruptcy cases. So. You're going to have bankruptcy cases where there's a 363 process where the assets are sold and, and new money is going to get control of the assets quickly, or you're going to have prearranged deals where there's going to be obviously a, a, a change of control um, where perhaps a lot of the new money, maybe it's exit financing or maybe it's the, the, the last out part of a revolver that Rich was talking about, it's going to pick up 85 to 90% of the common stock of the, of the company with a clean balance sheet. Well, my parting comment is that everybody who uh, is on the panel is really smart, so call one of them if you have a question. So, <laughs> There's uh, the commercial. We thank you. Uh, we thank you for your time this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to uh, answering any questions you might have, and uh, we're certainly all available, and people know where to find us. So thanks, everyone, and for those who participated on the webinar, we thank you as well. Thanks.